So we've been doing this series called God for the Rest of Us. And this is week five of a six-week series. And we've talked about the fact that God is for people who are far from Him. That there's nothing you could ever do, nothing that you've ever done, that could put you out of the reach of God's grace. Doesn't matter why you walked away, or where you've gone, or what you've done, God is still for you. He loves you. And He's inviting you into a relationship with Him. You may be someone today who's far from God. And maybe you didn't know that. But you need to know that. God loves you and is for you. You need to know that. Or maybe today you're already a Christian. You're someone who's already in a relationship with God. But you never really understood that God is for everyone. And if that's the case, you need to know that. Because it means that you also should be for everyone. You should be all about helping everyone know that God is for them. Tell me, Father. Lord. I ask for your Holy Spirit to be here today. Lord, give me your word. Not my word. Ask for your guidance and your presence. In your son's name. Amen. So today. I want to tell you that God is also for Christians. For people who have already said yes to that relationship. Who have already said yes to living a life of faith. Now that may seem like a pretty obvious statement. But I really want to dig into that. About what does it mean that God is for Christians. If you're a Christian, what does that mean for your life? So let's look at the, this through the eyes of one of Jesus' most famous followers, Peter. We've looked at Peter before in this series. And you probably know the story. Peter was one of the first people to put his faith in Jesus and to follow Jesus. And we see this in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, where it says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So at this point, Peter becomes a follower of Jesus. But what did that mean for Peter? You see, God was for Peter before he put his faith in Jesus. God was for him as a follower of Jesus. But what does it mean for Peter that God is for him now as a follower? It reminds me about in Canada. Any Canadians? Not fans. Any Canadians? No. Well, in Canada, there are two seasons. Winter 
and July. <laughs> and as you can imagine, when July rolled around after all that snow for 11 months, when July finally rolled around and things began to thaw out, there's a lot of water. And in some of those towns, they have dirt roads. All that water is terrible for dirt roads. It just makes them muddy roads. So people have to drive down those roads. And as they do so, they create ruts. All the way down the road, nothing but ruts. And then July ends, and winter comes back, and those ruts freeze as ruts. It's so bad that in one town they put up a sign that said, choose your ruts carefully because you will be in them the next 20 miles. Does that describe your life? Once upon a time you dreamed, but now your life is a boring, monotonous rut. The rut of getting up, going to work, coming home, eating dinner, watching TV for three hours, go to bed. Get up, go to work, come home, eat dinner, watch TV for three hours, go to sleep. Get up, go to work, come home, eat dinner, watch TV for three hours, and so it goes. It's infuriating the monotony. Until finally, you break down. Dad comes home from work, tired and frustrated. He yells at mom. Mom yells at the older brother. The older brother yells at the younger sister. The younger sister kicks the dog. The dog bites the cat. The cat scratches the baby. And the baby bites the head off of the barbie. You know, it would have been easier if they skipped all the in-between steps and Dad would have just come home and bit the head off the barbie doll. But that's not the way it goes. It's so easy to get stuck in that rut of meaningless life. But I'll tell you what. When Peter, Andrew, James, and John said yes to following Jesus, it was the best decision they ever made. It freed them from living in that meaningless life. And I can imagine Peter, the night before, at the local pub or wherever they hung out back then, and one of his buddies comes up to him and says, hey Pete, how you doing? And Peter says, great, I'm doing good. Can't complain. And his buddy says, well, that's good. That's nice. So what are you doing tomorrow? And Peter says, what are you kidding me? I'm doing the same thing tomorrow I do every day. I'm a fisherman. I'm fishing. And his buddy, with a bit of sarcasm, said, oh, really? What about the next day? And Peter, getting a little bit frustrated as he tended to do, said, Listen, pal, you know I'm going to be fishing the next year. What, what's your deal? Why do you keep bringing this up? And his buddy, knowing that he could get under Peter's skin pretty easily, said, what about the next day? And Peter loses his pool at this point and says, okay, let's take this outside. But then we get to the next morning. Peter gets up and falls into that normal routine. Puts on the same old clothes, drinks the same bad coffee, eats the same bowl of raisin bran, I don't know what they had for breakfast back then. <laughs> and he sets off to go fishing. But later that morning, out on the lake, Jesus comes by. Now Peter had seen Jesus before. He had heard Jesus speak. 
He had witnessed Jesus' character. And Peter, from the very first time he had come into contact with Jesus, Peter knew that there was no one like Jesus. No one. He figured there never was and probably would never be a person like Jesus. But that day, Jesus walked up, looked out to the boat. Peter looked in, probably wondering, I wonder why Jesus is standing there looking at him. Then he heard Jesus speak those words that would change his life forever. Come, follow me. Those words took his breath away. Could Jesus really want me to be his follower? Peter wasn't taking any chances. He just followed. Immediately, he followed. He left everything and followed Jesus. And I can imagine what happened that night. Because we know from the Bible, Peter was married. Peter gets home that night, tells his wife what's going on. I can imagine Mrs. Peter saying something like, you did what? Where'd you leave the net? Where's the boat? She probably thought Peter was going crazy. But Peter wasn't crazy. In fact, it was the most intelligent choice he'd ever made. The best thing he had ever done. Because that day, he started following Jesus. That day, he was free from living a meaningless life. And you can read through the biographies of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Peter is one of the main characters. And you can read through the history book on the early church, the book of Acts. And you come to find out that Peter's life is an amazing adventure. You could even picture him one day in the future running into that buddy from the pub. The buddy saying, hey Pete, long time, how you doing? And Peter saying something to the effect, I'm doing great, thanks for asking. And his buddy, trying to get underneath Peter's skin, says, what are you doing tomorrow, Peter? And Peter says, actually, tomorrow we plan to heal some sick people, to give them back full health. And his buddy is a bit confused. So he says, well, what about the next day? And I can imagine Peter saying, the next day, Oh, we're going to feed this entire community so that they're completely full. And we're going to do it with only a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. <laughs> Friends definitely confused at this point. He says, well, what about the day after that? And he says, well, the day after that, we're going to go into Samaria. And we're just going to completely tear down these walls that have been there for so long based on something so silly as the color of your skin. His friend doesn't quite know what to say, but he says, well, the next day? And Peter says, oh, well, hold on. Let me look at the calendar on my iPhone. He says, dude, the next day, my friend Jesus He's going to raise his best friend named Lazarus from the dead. That's going to be awesome. Oh, and did I tell you I walked on water? <laughs> I did, seriously. I did. And I cast out demons. You should have seen the time when Jesus healed the leper. And guess what? I don't really understand why, but Jesus has chosen me to be one of the leaders of his church. Can you believe that? I and mean, this is so cool. And, and guess what? And you can see Peter go on and on about everything that's happened since then. Think about it. Those four fishermen became the leaders of a worldwide revolution 2,000 years ago. 
And we're still talking about them today. Can you name any other Galilean fishermen from the first century? No. But we still know about these guys, and we still talk about these guys. People still name their kids after them. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, I'm sure we have some in the audience. God made their lives into something incredible. Something that we still talk about. When Peter chose to follow Jesus, it freed him from having a meaningless life. And if you said yes to Jesus following Jesus, God's for you. And it means that you also have been freed from a meaningless life. You're free to dream big, to take a risk, to live an adventure, to live God's adventure for your life. Part of God being for you is that He's for you living the life that He has created for you. Following Jesus means you live the way He lived. You do what He did. You're passionate about what He's passionate about. His mission becomes your mission. That's why when Jesus called Peter and the three others, he said, follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. So Jesus is all about people. He's all about helping people who are far from God come close to God. And when we follow him, now we're all about people. We're all about helping people who are far from God come close to God. And that is an adventure. In fact, it's an adventure that can inject an excitement even to the most boring parts of life. Like washing the dishes. Certainly a boring chore. But if you use that time while you're washing dishes to pray for people, and you believe that God answers prayer, well then when you're washing those, di those dishes, you're changing the world. Even a boring chore like washing the dishes can change the world. Or if you're getting your hair cut, I got it yesterday. A boring activity, but if you go into it looking for chances to share God's love with either the person who's cutting your hair or somebody else at the barbershop, salon, wherever, that's an adventure filled with meaning, an opportunity, a chance. And when you realize that God is for you and you decide to follow Jesus, you are now free from that meaningless life. And not only are you free from a meaningless life, but you're also now freed to fail. And that's huge. Because I think you could agree that we're not fully living unless we're living with a fear. And we're not fully living if we're living with a fear of failure. But a lot of us do live with that fear of failure. And I think the reason we're so afraid to fail is that because we think that if we do fail, that we won't matter. And we desperately want to matter. Many of us grew up with this fear of failure. Because some of us were taught, for some it may have been our parents, others it may have been teachers, other than maybe people in a church. But many of us were taught that our worth depended on our performance. If we got good grades, we were good boys and girls. If we got bad grades, we were bad boys and girls. If we did good in sports, 
We were accepted and approved of. But if we did bad, we weren't accepted and approved of. And we quickly, quickly learned and had it repeatedly enforced to us that how much we are worth was directly proportional with how well we perform. And that scared us. It scared us to fail. Because what would it mean if we fail? So maybe you have a fear of failure. But all of that changes when you're loved with an unconditional love. And that's exactly the kind of love that God has for us. God doesn't love us based upon our performance. God loves us even when we are at our worst. In fact, the Bible tells us that God chose to do the very worst thing for him, to have his son die. For us, when we are at our very worst, and we see that in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, where it says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christians tend to understand that. We understand this idea of grace, that God offers us the opposite of what we deserve, that we deserve punishment for our sins and separation from God because we chose to rebel against Him. But because of His love, God gave us the opposite of what we deserve. Jesus died to take the punishment that we deserve so that he could take on our sins to bring us into a relationship with God. We understand that. Chris. But what's interesting is that a lot of people, when they become a Christian, they think that somehow switches. That, we'll, that we become a Christian by grace, despite of our performance. But once we become a Christian, it's all now based upon our performance. That we couldn't earn our salvation. But once we receive it, then we need to start earning it from God. It's wrong. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that as Christians, God continues to love us with an unconditional love. It's not based upon our performance. He is still for us. And we see that as we continue in Romans chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from, his, from God's wrath through him. For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? I think it took Peter a little while to understand this. You see, when Jesus was arrested and put on trial, when he needed Peter the most, that's when Peter denied even knowing Jesus. Three times, he denied even knowing Jesus. And I imagine Peter probably felt ashamed by that. Felt like a failure. But then Jesus rose from the grave. 
Peter knew that. And we find Peter after the resurrection. And Peter is again fishing. Why is he fishing? He's gone back to his old life. Jesus told him to leave that boat, to become a fisher of men. But Peter failed Jesus. He doesn't think he's worthy anymore. So he's back in the boat as a fisherman. Well, Jesus showed up again. And Peter and the other guys all join Jesus. And they eat a meal together. And look at what the Bible says happens next. We find it in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than me? Yes, Lord. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. The third time Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And I wonder, what exactly is Jesus trying to say to Peter here? And I imagine he's, I think he's trying to say, Peter, we all know you performed pretty poorly. We all know that you failed. We all know that you didn't show me that you loved me more than these others like you said you would. But you know what, Peter? I love you. And that's what matters. I love you. And I'm here to tell you that you have value. That you have worth. And that you have importance. And it has nothing to do with how you perform. So Peter, don't worry about your failures. Go feed my sheep. Tell people that I love them in the same way that I have loved you unconditionally. That's my message. Go tell them. And now you can tell them in a way that you never would have been able to before had you succeeded. But now that you failed, I love you anyway. And you can tell people that's the same way that I will love them. What Jesus does here for Peter is what he wants to do for you and I. Jesus applies the greatest healing force in the universe, the unconditional love of God. I mean, if Jesus wanted to love somebody conditionally, Peter was a pretty good candidate. His performance is pretty pathetic. But that's not how Jesus loved Peter. He loved Peter unconditionally. And that unconditional love redeemed and repaired Peter's broken life. He loved Peter with a love that restored worth and dignity to Peter right when he thought he was an outcast for good. And it completely changed Peter. It let him know that he was free to fail. And the Peter that we see later in the Bible, who lives a courageous, risk-taking adventure, who becomes a leader in the church, is a Peter that would have never existed if it weren't for his failure and his experiencing the unconditional love of Jesus. And the good news is that God is for Christians. Jesus offers us that same unconditional 
love. He offers it to people who have failed him often. He offers it to people like you and like me, who have had conditional love demean us, demean our self-worth, rob us of our self-esteem, make us afraid to take chances. Jesus will show up. He will show up in our lives and will apply the greatest healing force in the universe, the unconditional love of God. And He will love us back to full health. All we have to do is let Him. When we do, we get out of this performance system and into the grace system. We understand that God's love doesn't depend on us performing correctly, even once we're Christians. God's love depends on God, on His character, and on what He did for us on the cross. And so we get to live and appreciate His love. And that's the right motivation for living for Him. Not trying to earn something from him, which is a selfish motivation, but being grateful to him, which is a worshipful motivation. It's like God loves me so much that I don't have to perform correctly. But that makes me want to perform correctly. God loves you unconditionally. So if you fail, it's okay. And that means freedom. We're free to take a risk. We're free to go for it. Because God is for us. We're free from this meaningless life. We're also free to fail. And we're also free from the fear of death. George Bernard Shaw once wrote, the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of one people dies. <laughs> death is one of our greatest fears. I like what Woody Allen once said. It's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> We're all afraid to die. But following Jesus frees us from that fear of death. Why? Because of the resurrection. Because Jesus walked out of that grave and defeated death. Amen. And promised that anyone who follows him in this life will follow him out of that grave. They will defeat death and will follow him into heaven and live with him forever. That's what happened with Peter. We see him before the resurrection, totally afraid to die. That's why when Jesus needed him the most, he denied even knowing him. He was afraid of the consequences. He was afraid of dying, just like Jesus was about to die. But after the resurrection, we see Peter taking stand taking a stand for Jesus. Knowing that his life was on the line, but doing it anyway. And eventually, Peter died. He was killed because he was not willing to deny Jesus again. Why? Because he was freed from that fear of death. I heard a story of an old Christian man who lived a life in a close relationship with God. And he was about to die. His son sat next to him and asked his dad, Dad, how are you feeling? And his father responded, Son, I'm like a little boy on Christmas Eve. You and I can face death 
with that same kind of confidence and joy. Because following Jesus, who walked out of that grave, frees us from the fear of death. I love the story of how Steve Jobs recruited John Scully to join Apple when they were first starting out. John Scully had become the youngest president of Pepsi Corporation at the age of 38. He masterminded the Pepsi Generation campaign and was on a meteoric rise in the cola company. Steve Jobs was one of the two people who founded Apple Computers. And back in the early 80s, the company was still in its infancy. And they pursued John Scully to join them. Jobs met with Scully countless times. He used all of the persuasive skills that he had. But Scully refused to leave his cushy, safe job with Pepsi for the risk of some startup computer company. Jobs tried to explain to him that information technology, the information technology that Apple was developing, would have a major influence on global culture, would have a huge impact going into the 21st century. The Scully still turned him down. Finally, it was their last meeting. It was Jobs' last chance to change Scully's mind. He asked, are you going to come join Apple? And Scully answered, I can't leave my job with Pepsi. Jobs dropped his head and he stared at the pavement. And after a weighty, uncomfortable pause, he asked one final question. He said, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water? Or do you want a chance to change the world? That challenge cut to Scully's heart. And it challenged his mind. It changed his mind. And he left Pepsi and joined Apple. That day when Jesus approached Peter at the lake, I think that's basically what Jesus was saying, was asking him, Peter, do you want to spend the rest of your life as a fisherman? Or do you want a chance to change the world? I think he asked the same question to you and I. You want to spend the rest of your life getting up, going to work, coming home, eating dinner, watching TV for three hours, going to bed? Or do you want a chance to change the world? God's for us. So he sent Jesus to share his love with the whole world. God is for Christians. And because of the fact that he is, Jesus is calling you, is calling me, to follow him in his mission. To leave whatever you need to behind. Let's join him. Let's follow him. Have a Lord, I ask that you be with each person here. Lord, help us to leave behind whatever it is that's keeping us from fully following you, from fully turning our hearts over to you and doing whatever it is that you would have us to do. Help us to leave behind the monotony of life, to get out of the rut, so that we can through you, change the world.